the Williamsburg Area League of Women Voters is producing in partnership with the Williamsburg Regional Library. I'm Marianne Moxon and Bobby Falke will join us in a few minutes. Since 1920, the League of, League of Women Voters has been an activist yet nonpartisan organization that never supports or opposes candidates or parties. We believe that people should play a critical role in democracy. We focus on voting rights, civic education, and advocacy. Please visit our website to subscribe to our eVoter newsletter. To join the league, we have more than 300 members right now in our local league, and to view our first two webinars in June and July if you missed them. The scheduling of this topic today was serendipity because 100 years ago on this very day, the 19th Amendment passed after a very long fight and women earned the right to vote. We hope that you learn a few more facts about suffrage today. But the print and the TV media have given tremendous recent coverage to the centennial of women's suffrage. Even in a new, new that was a faux pas, even in a new Lady Gaga video, which I saw this morning, it presents the topic in a brand new fashion that you will remember. If you haven't seen it, just Google Lady Gaga and women's suffrage. Never thought I'd be saying that. We're also celebrating 100 years of the League of Women Voters. Suffragist Carrie Captain Chat founded the League in 1920, six months prior to the ratification of the 19th Amendment. Cat described the League as a mighty political experiment that would help the 20 million newly enfranchised women become informed voters. And men have been League members too since 1964. More about Carrie Chapman Cat later. What will we cover today? The history of the women's suffrage movement is quite complex. And many say that history books have whitewashed it by focusing on only a few suffragists. We aim to remedy that today, although it's impossible to include the many black, indigenous, and women of color who also fought for suffrage. Native American and Chinese women and men even needed to fight to be called citizens. And we recognize that many black women did not get to vote for 45 years after the 19th Amendment, not until the Voting Rights Act passed in 1965. That act, has, that act has been in the news a lot lately, ever since the death of John Lewis, one of the Voting Rights Act's most valued advocates. Many are hoping that it will be reauthorized soon. We hope that today's webinar will help you to value the sacred, sacred right of voting as much as the early suffragists did. We hope to give time at the end if you have any questions, please submit them in the chat box. Susan B. Anthony, very quietly standing here behind me at the moment, is the suffragist who gets the most credit, but hundreds more should be included. In Susan's time, women were generally excluded from political and in many ways public life. They couldn't vote, could not own property, or control any wages that they earned if they could even get a job. Susan was arrested for voting in the 1872 presidential election in her hometown of Rochester, Rochester, New York. She actually planned to be arrested. She was convicted in a widely publicized trial at which she was not allowed to speak. On the final day of the trial, when the judge asked Anthony if she had anything to say, she defiantly said, I shall never pay a dollar of your unjust penalty. And the judge surprised all in the courtroom and Susan by announcing that she would not be jailed for failure to pay. That would have allowed her to appeal to the Supreme Court, which was her goal of the day. That was one of her first big disappointments. Note that she died in 1906, 14 years before the 19th Amendment passed. And at this moment, President Trump may be granting her a pardon posthumously. But many decades before Susan B. Anthony, Abigail Adams, John's wise wife, advised him to, quote, remember the ladies. Sadly, he forgot that advice as he was consulting with his buddies at the founding, with the, his buddies, the founding fathers in Philadelphia during the months of the Constitutional Convention. When they drafted the Constitution, they made no mention of women. And Abigail's words were indeed true. Women will foment a rebellion and will not hold ourselves bound by any laws in which we have no voice or representation. 
John should have listened. No one knows whether New Jersey legislators meant to do it as they rushed through their state constitution, but the US constitution had given states the right to vote, to run elections and to set the terms of voting. So single and widowed women and a few freed black men who owned property could vote in New Jersey until 1807 when the state legislators restricted voting to property owning white males only. As they say, it was nice while it lasted. But in the early 1800s, accusations of voter fraud arose with claims of Philadelphia residents appearing on New Jersey poll lists and even married women. Casting doubts about democracy is not new. Another well-known suffragist is Quaker Elizabeth Cady Stanton. She spent years caring for a sickly husband and seven children. She and her Quaker friends were very frustrated by what they saw as the Quaker faith's unwillingness to support the abolition of slavery and women's rights. I think of her frequently at breakfast because of her uncanny resemblance to the Quaker Oats Fellow. Suffrage and ab abolitionist movements occurred at the same time and many women, especially Quaker women, worked in both. Sojourner Truth, who was born Isabella or Belle Baumfrey, was an abolitionist, but also a frequently overlooked women's suffrage rights activist. She believed that giving black men the right to vote and not women would only allow men more domination over women. Current books accuse the women's suffrage movement of too much focus on Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton, both of whom will soon join Sojourner Truth in Central Park in a long overdue sculpture that will be unveiled in a few weeks on August 26th on Women's Equality Day. That is the 100th anniversary of the day in 1920 when the, the 19th Amendment was certified and it became official. Many say that the women's suffrage movement began at a tea party in New York State in 1848 around the table of a very well-to-do Quaker woman, Jane Hunt. She had invited four other Quakers to enjoy a cup of tea with her that day. They soon began to air their grievances about the world's injustices toward women. Two of the women present at what we today call a gripe session were Lucretia Mott and Elizabeth Cady Stanton. These women were frustrated by the moral code of that era that expected women to be flawless and submissive wives and to accept that home was considered their, quote, rightful place. Elizabeth Cady Stanton had a lot to say that day over tea, including the right to vote is ours. Have it we must, use it we will. Stanton had known Lucretia Mott for eight years before this historic tea. The first time they had met was not in a quiet gathering of women, but in London with a group of men committed to ending slavery worldwide. Lucretia had traveled to London for the World Anti-Slavery Convention as an official American delegate. Stanton was there too on her honeymoon with her abolitionist husband. But when they arrived, they learned that many delegates didn't even want them to be there. They were told they'd have to sit in a roped off gallery and that they couldn't speak or vote. Of course they protested, but they were forced to sit there on the sidelines, humiliated and furious. They resolved to hold a convention as soon as they got home and to form a society to advocate the rights of women. <coughs> These two were just getting started. Only 10 days and one newspaper ad later, about 300 women and men gathered in Seneca Falls, New York at this convention to discuss the social, civil and religious rights of women. Mott and Stanton had drafted an organizing document, the Declaration of Sentiments. One of those sentiments demanded the right for women to vote as a human right. This resolution on suffrage actually passed, but not unanimously as the rest of them did. This one was signed by 62 women and 32 men, including Frederick Douglass, but with dissenters. Some men argued that women's suffrage detracted from the far more urgent goal of voting rights for former slaves. Remember, this took place in New York and that had been a slave state until 1827, just 20 years before this convention. But with the words, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men and women are created equal. The fight for women's suffrage in America took off. 
It's important to note that one famous suffragist, Susan B. Anthony, was not at this convention. She had not even met Elizabeth Cady Stanton yet. Amelia Bloomer, the woman of less restrictive clothing fame, was at that convention and she introduced this legendary dynamic duo about three years after the convention. One reason that women of color did not receive the recognition they deserved was that these two wrote a six volume history of women's suffrage with 5,700 pages in which they placed themselves as the powerhouses and took most of the credit for the suffrage movement. They were definitely not humble women. Frederick Douglass had escaped from slavery in Maryland. He was the only African American at the Seneca Falls Convention. No women had been invited. He was one of the 32 men who had supported that resolution on women voting. But there's a lesser known story of his on again, off again friendship with Anthony and Stanton. They got into heated debates about who should get the right to vote first, black men or women. Some have even painted Susan B. Anthony as a racist over her stubborn insistence that women get the right to vote before African Americans. Elizabeth Cady Stanton even questioned why the rights of free black men should take priority over, in her words, more qualified and deserving white women. Douglas argued that extending suffrage to black men had a realistic chance of passing in Congress, but universal suffrage did not. So was Susan racist for not supporting black men getting the right to vote? Or was Douglas sexist for wanting women to sit back and wait their turn for suffrage? There are two problems with this accusation. First, Anthony never stopped advocating for racial justice, even after the 15th Amendment passed, <clears throat> which gave only black men the right to vote. She delivered countless speeches about eradicating racist, racist prejudices throughout the country and condemned lynchings in the South. And Douglas never stopped advocating for women's rights up to his sudden death from a heart attack only hours, of sit sit only hours after sitting beside Susan B. Anthony at a suffrage event. Today, we hope to introduce you to many suffragists in the archives of history and encourage you to learn more about them. One slide cannot begin to capture their spirit and persistence. Nor can we adequately tell this long history in 50 minutes. But here is Lucy Stone, who along with Anthony and Stanton were called the quote, 19th century triumvirate of women's suffrage. Lucy was a renowned and persuasive orator, but at odds with the other two after the Civil War. She kept her birth name after marriage, which was not common then and eventually thought that reform of marriage laws was even more important than women voting. And Lucy, if you notice her dates of her death, was another one who never got to vote. Frances E. W. Harper was another heroine of the early suffrage movement, who black women frequently worked side by side with white suffragists. After Harper's husband died suddenly, she lost all her property. Harper's refusal to give up her seat on a Philadelphia trolley car in 1858 has been ignored through the years. Rosa Parks' refusal, a hundred years later, to move to the back of the bus, got the nation's attention. In 1894, Harper helped found the National Association of Colored Women after disagreeing with Stanton and Anthony over enfranchising black men before women. And Harper is another suffragist who didn't get to vote. She died nine years before the 19th Amendment passed. <laughs> By the late 1800s, after the Civil War, the suffrage movement had splintered over the issue of race. Black women formed their own organizations, such as the African American Women's League and the National Association of Colored Women. Note in this photo that Mrs. Booker T. Washington appears on the right. Women's suffrage was definitely in the headlines, but all were not in agreement. A division, even between women themselves, was getting a bit nasty in tone. Cartoons like this one got a lot of attention. Some women, and many men, still believed that the women's place was in the home. Newspapers printed anti-suffrage editorials. Even the New York Times was against women voting in those years. Cartoons of the day reflected men's fear of children, child care and domestic, fear of children probably, fear of child care and domestic duties. 
poor suffering husbands indeed. Anti-suffrage organizations began popping up in almost all states, and many believe this was a decision best left to the individual states anyway, as the Constitution seemed to imply. The National Association Opposed to Women's Suffrage, formed in 1911, had branches by 1916 in 25 states. In 1912, the Virginia Anti-Suffrage Group formed, believing that women were above the dirty business of politics. But a driving force was their fear that black women would vote in large numbers in Virginia and threaten white supremacy in the state. Anti-suffrage cartoons were not especially kind either, nor did they always reflect the difference between suffragist and suffragette. Here we have at 15 a little pet, at 20 a little coquette, at 40 not married yet, at 50 a suffragette. Is there a difference between suffragists or suffragettes? Absolutely. American women fighting for the vote called themselves suffragists and considered suffragettes an offensive term. That was a term widely used in Britain. A British journalist had coined the table suffragette to mock members of the suffrage movement in England. Mm -hmm. It used militant efforts. They had given up on this just talking. They were using militant efforts such as arson, hunger strikes, destruction of public property, and even bombs to fight for suffrage. The British journalist added that diminutive suffix at the end, et, to minimize these women. But they embraced this intended insult and called themselves suffragettes with a hard G to signify that they were going to get the right to vote. Virginia women were very active suffragists too. Anna Bodecker and Virginia Woodhull, Google her for an interesting story on how she was really the first woman to run for president. They even tried to vote in 1871. Lila Mead Valentine was a mover shaker in the suffrage movement too, in the early 1900s. She served as Equal Suffrage League of Virginia president. If her name sounds a bit familiar, the Valentine Museum in Richmond was funded by her family. As you can see, getting a bit ahead of myself here, Virginia's legislature in the Confederate capital, capital voted against women's suffrage repeatedly at the state level and even rejected the 19th Amendment in 1920. They finally got around to ratifying it in 1952. Only six states followed them. Not surprisingly, they were Florida, South Carolina, Georgia, Louisiana, North Carolina, and finally, Mississippi in 1984. At the time of the 1912 convention of the National Association of Colored Women in Hampton, Virginia, black women were not welcome in the Equal Suffrage League. So in Virginia, Janie Porter Everett Barrett, another marginalized suffragist, founded the Virginia State Federation of Colored Women's Clubs in 1908. Suffrage parades were starting to get into the heyday at this time as well. Here is the iconic 1912 suffrage photo in New York City with a very young suffragist in her stroller. I assume it's a her. Suffragists have begun to employ a more aggressive and public spectacle now as they literally took to the streets, parades, pageants, open air meetings, strikes, often decked out in white dresses and wearing sashes saying vote for women. More and more women were willing now to risk their dress and possibly jail sentences for their actions. This brash, in-your-face mentality made suffragists very hard to ignore. One unsung suffrage heroine who <laughs> rode a white horse at the head of that 1912 parade was Mabel Lee who could not even vote after 1920 because of the Chinese Exclusion Act. She became the first woman to receive a PhD from Columbia, but in that parade, Mabel wore a tri-cornered hat in the colors of the British suffrage movement, purple to symbolize that the cause of suffrage was noble, white for purity, and green the color of spring as a symbol of hope. American suffragists frequently substituted gold for green to represent the sunflowers of Kansas, where they waged some of their earliest campaigns. 
and no one really knows if, if Mabel ever got to vote. Even after the Magnuson Act in 1934 granted citizenship and the vote to Chinese in America. Ida B. Wells was in the headlines earlier this year, not so much for her suffrage activities, but for being posthumously awarded the Pulitzer Prize for her amazing exposés of the horrors of lynching. But major differences within pro predominantly white suffrage organizations, including the National American Women's Suffrage Association, have prevented the integration of Black women into the movement. White suffragists were frequently loath to feature Black women in their public events, lest they, quote, alienate Southern politicians. So Black women set about organizing themselves. Wells founded the first African-American suffrage organization in Chicago. As Mary Church Terrell began to champion the cause of suffrage, she joined the National American Women's Suffrage Association as one of the very few Black members, and she took, ta took them to task for excluding more women of color. So in 1896, she founded and served as first president of the National Association of Colored Women, NACW. Under their motto, Lifting as We Climb, the NACW pursued a broad agenda and confronted discrimination in all facets of American life. Now we move to the 1913 parade, which was the first March on Washington. Probably the most memorable image of that day is suffragist Inez Milholland, astride a white horse. Newspapers were fascinated by her, describing her as the, quote, most beautiful suffrage, suffragist. Inez is worth Googling, too. She had a fantastic life. Unfortunately, she died at age 30 in 1916 and never got to vote either. And this parade, by the way, was organized by another Quaker, Alice Paul. As we saw, the early suffragists did not always agree with each other about tactics or goals, and neither did the suffragists a generation later. New Jersey's Alice Paul believed in more militant tactics than simply writing about suffrage or going state to state to win women the right to vote. She had spent some time in England and had gotten into the militant tactics. Her goal was to amend the Constitution, and she organized the first ever March on Washington, otherwise known as a parade. Thousands of women from across the country gathered. Who was there that day? Along with 24 parade floats, nine bands, mounted brigades, and more than 5,000 marchers. Women from countries that had already allowed women to vote were there. Thousands of cheering spectators were on the sidelines, many in town for Woodrow Wilson's inauguration. But there were also quite a few angry, jeering men, many of whom had been drinking. All went well for a few blocks, but trouble was lurking. And we now know that 22 members of the Delta Sigma Theta sorority were among the thousands of women there that day too. The two women in this photo, Osceola Adams and Bertha Campbell, had co-founded this sorority at Howard University in January 1913, just a few months before the parade. Ida Wells and 60 of her all white, except for her Chicago suffrage Jew, group were there too. The black women were asked to march at the rear of the parade to quote, not offend the sensibilities of any Southerners. You can predict how well that request was received. The Deltas broke from their segregated section to mix with the rest of the parade. And Ida Wells was also seen slipping into line between the white women of her Chicago delegation. Thus living up to her motto, quote, one had better die fighting against injustice than die like a dog or rat in a trap. These are feisty women. In her biography, Campbell recalled, some cheered, however, many jeered and tried to disrupt the marchers by throwing things, spitting on, beating and slapping the women and trying to pull them off the floats. At age 92, Bertha returned to the parade for the big celebration and joined 10,000 of her fellow, fellow sister Deltas when they recreated that parade in, in DC. This is the elaborate 11 page parade program for the 1930 procession as it's called or parade to the White House. Now it was not called a march, 
As mentioned, Alice Paul meticulously planned it for the day before Woodrow Wilson's 1913 inaugural day, knowing there'd be a lot of people in town that day. It was the first organized march down Pennsylvania Avenue in DC for political purposes, with between 5,000 and 10,000 marchers. The official program printed in advance of the event anticipated a nice dignified and orderly procession. In contrast, the actual parade was disrupted by an unruly crowd who jeered, tripped, grabbed, and attacked the women, sending more than a hundred of them to the hospital. A totally inadequate police presence was there that day too. The U.S. Secretary of War finally called in a cavalry troop to try to push the crowd. Ambulances came and went for six hours. No tear gas that day, but an investigation and a congressional inquiry into the police action, or rather inaction, followed. Sounds somewhat familiar, doesn't it? Google this 1930 suffrage parade and you'll find some amazing footage of the shocking events that took place. We have one such video at the end of this webinar if you stay with us. Another suffragist marching in this famous 1913 parade was Mary Louise Botineau Baldwin, a Chippewa tribe lawyer who worked in the Office of Indian Affairs. For her official government photo here in 1911, she chose to wear her native dress and braid her hair. Native Americans did not receive citizenship until Calvin Coolidge signed the Indian Citizenship Act of 1924. Native Americans who were veterans of World War I had been offered citizenship in 1919. That was just citizenship. The right to vote was still governed by state law and interpreted by the courts to not apply to Native Americans. Arizona and New Mexico continued to bar Native Americans from voting until 1948. What can I say? Some things never change. We still march. You may have seen these league members in this year's Rose Bowl Parade. Not on horses this time. Williamsburg Area League members also march in the William and Mary Homecoming Parade, unfortunately canceled this year. For more on suffrage protests, I'll now hand the remaining portion of our webinar to Bobby Falke who you may recognize for her past work at the Great Decisions Program in February and March, which likely will be virtual in 2021. Bobby. Thanks, Mary Ann. How to get Wilson's attention. Picketing and protesting with signs and banners soon replaced parades. This particular banner was obviously meant to get President Wilson's attention. Four years after the famous 1913 parade, and quite frustrated, Alice Paul and others decided to step up their efforts by protesting in front of the White House in 1917. The first time that had been done, by the way. These famous silent sentinels included Virginians picketing the White House at, in Lafayette Square, frequently with the banner asking, Mr. President, how long must women wait for liberty? The silent sentinels highlighted their diversity with theme days. On state days, such as Maryland Day, the marchers all came from Maryland. On college day, pickets represented 13 colleges. Other days highlighted women in professions, such as Teacher's Day. Initially, passers-by viewed the marchers with curiosity and sympathy, and the White House tolerated their presence. But in April, after the U.S. entered the World War I, the public mood changed, and many thought it unpatriotic to pick up the president during a time of war. Wilson was still adamantly opposed to women voting, and soon the police started arresting the women for blocking traffic, even jailed some for up to 60-day prison terms. At one peaceful protest in 1917, Alice Paul, who had been absent from the picket lines for quite some time, was arrested along with 33 others for obstructing traffic. Alice was given the longest prison sentence yet, seven months. Alice really knew how to draw attention to a cause. Suffrage is frequently mispronounced as suffrage but that's somewhat accurate. These women frequently suffered. Here's a poster of a suffragist on a hunger strike, being force-fed that got the attention and sympathy of many. 
After demanding that she and the other silent sentinels who were arrested and treated, be, I'm sorry, after demanding that she and the other silent sentinels who were arrested be treated as political prisoners, Alice Paul went on a hunger strike. Doctors force fed her twice a day, tight tying and holding her down and forcing a tube down her throat, a process that caused her to vomit repeatedly. The superintendent of St. Elizabeth's Hospital was asked to interview her in a vain attempt to have her committed, but he found Paul to be sane and perfectly calm yet determined. Alice described her earlier such experience with being force fed in 1909 in England, where she was held in jail for 30 days with these words, the largest wardress sat astride my knees, holding my shoulders down to keep me from bending forward. Two other wardresses sat on either side and held my arms. One doctor from behind forced my head back while another doctor put a tube in my nostril. When it reached my throat, my head was pushed forward. Twice the tube came through my mouth and I got it between my teeth. My mouth was then pried open with an instrument. Sometimes they tied me to a chair with sheets. Once I managed to get my hands loose and snatch that tube, tearing it with my teeth. I also broke a jug, but I didn't give in. Lucy Burns, who has also wanted a constitutional amendment, was with Alice in London during this time and again at the White House protest. Lucy served six different prison sentences for peaceful picketing during the many years that President Woodrow Wilson opposed women voting. But on April 14, 1917, soon to be called the Night of Terror, 33 women, including Alice Paul and Lucy Burns, were arrested and endured a brutal night in the Aquaquan workhouse in Virginia. The women were clubbed, beaten, choked, slammed, and tortured by 40 guards who went on a rampage. Lucy Burns had her hands shackled to the top of her cell, forcing her to stand all night. One woman was knocked unconscious. Another who thought Burns was dead had a heart attack and did not get medical attention until the following morning. The oldest prisoner was 73 and her written account got out. Newspapers carried the stories about how the protesters were being treated. When the public learned the atrocities of that night of terror, a major turning point in the suffrage movement occurred. An amazing turning, turning point suffrage memorial is being created near the infamous Aquaquan workhouse in Lorton, where Alice Paul and Lucy Burns suffered. The groundbreaking took place last year on November 14th on the 102nd anniversary of the Night of Terror. This memorial will provide an overview of the entire suffrage movement, including African-American suffragists who are often left out of the history books. A momentous day-long celebration had been planned for August 26, 2020 to formally dedicate the memorial and mark the 100th anniversary of the 19th Amendment, but it has been indefinitely postponed. On a Sunday afternoon in December 1917, several thousand women filled a theater in Washington, D.C. for a mass meeting organized by the National Women's Party. The event was planned to honor the self-respecting and patriotic American women who had picketed the White House and served time in jail that summer and fall, including Alice Paul, who had recently been released after five weeks in prison. Eighty-nine women, all dressed in white, marched to the stage where they were presented with a small one by one and a half inch pin in the shape of the locked door of a prison cell. Many of them wore this proudly for the rest of their lives. They had certainly earned it. Getting back to the suffrage timeline, the National American Women's Suffrage Association wholeheartedly threw themselves into the war, using women's patriotic service as yet another rationale for the vote. President Wilson finally understood that these women were not going to stop until they got the vote and that their war efforts should be recognized. Wilson finally announced his support for the 19th Amendment on June, January 9th, 1918. One year after Woodrow Wilson announced his support, 
and during this time, recent research claims that he contracted the Spanish flu. The Susan B. Anthony Amendment, as it was called, came to a vote in Congress. The House passed the 19th Amendment in May, the Senate two weeks later. Now it needed to be ratified by at least 36 states, but the Southern states remained opposed. I'm not going to read this wordy slide, but Lin-Manuel Miranda could have put these numbers into song. A lot did happen in a lot of rooms. Look at those numbers. That's a total of 909 campaigns conducted by suffragists in many states. Who had the organizational skills to organize this mammoth undertaking? Harry Chapman Catt president of the National Woman's Suffrage Organization until 1920. You might remember her from an earlier slide as the founder of the League of Women Voters. But 101 years ago, in early June 1919, Carrie Chapman Catt and fellow suffragists sat silently in the U.S. Senate chamber as men prepared to vote on the Susan B. Anthony Amendment for the third time in less than a year. A few senators had changed their votes, realizing that recent suffrage victories at the state level just might translate into more votes for, from women for them. Others responded to pressure from President Wilson, a late convert to the cause who'd recently endorsed the amendment as something owed to women for shouldering the burdens of World War I at home. Now it was time to lead a shrewd state-by-state -state campaign to persuade the states to ratify the 19th. She had to pander to racist politicians in the South who feared votes for them being outnumbered if black women were to become enfranchised. Some of her words would come back to haunt her. Her writings reveal some rather insensitive, some might say racist comments, especially in regards to immigrants that she later repudiated. But words matter, and there's an ongoing effort to rename Cat Hall at Iowa State that was named for her. Once again, we see parallels to today. I stress again that our Constitution gave the states the power to run elections and determine who could vote. And a few states had already accepted women as voters. Wyoming was the first state to give women the right to vote in 1890. Wyoming was also the first state to elect a female governor in 1924. By 1896, Colorado, Idaho, and Utah had also done so. Not because they wanted equality, but because these new Western territories, soon to become states, wanted more women to move West and more votes for more representation in Congress. By 1918, 15 states, mainly in the West, plus New York, Michigan, and Rhode Island, had full female suffrage, while a few others, those checkered states, granted women, <laughs> granted women partial voting rights, as in local elections, but they needed 36 states to ratify the 19th. Okay, we're together. After a lot more lobbying, pleading and cajoling, 35 states had ratified the 19th Amendment. Only one more needed, but both North Carolina and Tennessee were far from likely to ratify. And three states refused to even call a special session. But Tennessee agreed, so Kerry and friends headed to Tennessee. Florida is shown in orange here because they did not ratify the 19th until 1969. Surprisingly, they were not the last. That role belongs to Mississippi in 1984. Some say the War of the Roses took place that day in Tennessee on August 18, 1920. Supporters of ratification wore yellow roses. Those opposed to the 19th Amendment red roses. It looked like a tie when freshman Republican legislator Harry T. Byrne, who was wearing a red rose, read the note from his mother that was still in his pocket and switched his vote after voting twice to table the vote. His mother had written him, hurrah and vote for suffrage. Be a good boy and help Mrs. Cat with her rats. 
Is she the one who put the rat in ratification? Harry incurred the wrath of his red rose carrying peers, but avoided that of his mother. Most likely a wise choice. Byrne even won on a second term. The 19th Amendment was signed into law a few days later on August 26, 1920. It was historic after a 72 year battle. Neither Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony were alive to enjoy the victory. Elizabeth had died 18 years earlier in 1902 and Susan B. Anthony in 1906. It had been 72 years since the Seneca Falls Convention. Note that Virginia did not ratify the 19th for another 32 years. Elizabeth Cady Stanton's daughter Harriet worked with her mother in suffrage work and later Harriet's daughter Nora marched in parades. Kat's quote here is meaningful. Young suffragists who helped forge the last links of that chain were not even born when it began. Old suffragists who forged the first links were dead when it ended. Only one woman from Seneca Falls, Charlotte Woodward Pierce, got to vote in 1920. But all women in America were not able to vote after that election day in 1920. White women may have celebrated with ticker tape parades, but black women and men in the former Confederacy can tell another story. Jim Crow laws across the South deliberately kept African Americans from fully participating in democracy by requiring poll taxes, literacy tests, and property ownership. Black men and women were frequently defrauded by voting registrars, driven away from registration offices under threat of violence, or intimidated by the very real threat of lynching. They continued their fight for full vote voting rights for another 45 years until the passage of the Voting Rights Act in 1965. Some are still fighting for the right to vote as barriers to voting have been resurrected after the Supreme Court decision in 2013 to remove some of the federal oversight or pre-clearance in states with a history of voter suppression. More about barriers to voting in our webinar next month on September 15th. Please put that date on your calendar. Women now needed to register to vote. Maggie Lena Walker registered hundreds of black women to vote in Richmond. After the 19th Amendment passed, she was the first female black president, bank president and had a lot of influence in Virginia. Mary McLeod Bethune, born to parents who'd been slaves, aggressively registered black women in the South in spite of being threatened by the KKK. Her legacy is much too long to do her justice in one slide. Between 75,000 and 100,000 women registered to vote in Virginia. Some registrars resigned in protest and began to develop Jim Crow laws as barriers to voting. Black women were not always welcome in many suffrage organizations, including the League of Women Voters in Southern states. History books tend to credit the courage and tenacity of white women in winning the right to vote. It's past time to amend that history and tell the real story of the suffrage movement that you have heard today and celebrate the women of color who were at the center of the movement alongside their white counterparts. So after hearing about the struggle these women went through, what can you do? Just read these inspirational words from Susan B. Anthony, someone struggled for your right to vote, use it. And from the first black women, woman elected to Congress, Shirley Chisholm, if they don't give you a seat at the table, bring a folding chair. The US currently ranks 75th in women elected to Congress. And here they are. We must keep alive the spirit and passion of the suffragists from generations ago. We must learn from the lessons of history. Strict photo ID laws, gerrymandering, purges of voter lists, and interference with foreign governments 
continue to threaten truly free elections in our country. If running for office is not in the cards for you, stay in touch with folks you elected. If this was your phone the last time you called any elected official, it's been a way too long. We elected them, then desert them. Attend some local meetings, invite a friend to join you, speak out, protest peacefully. And while you're staying at home, learn about the issues that concern you most. Facts for Voters is posted on our website at lwvwilliamsburg.org. We make it easy to know them and contact them. You may have visited the National Archives, Archives exhibit last fall before we were all shut in. It features the League and will be at the National Archives Museum in DC through January 3rd, 2021. If you missed it, Check out the very informative display that they sent to our local league that is now on display in the Williamsburg Main Library. Next month in Civics 101, we'll look at barriers to voting, suppression or fraud, a very timely topic, but please put September 15th on your calendars. We will address your questions now, and during this time, we'll share a list of resources on our next slide that teachers and homeschooling parents will especially find helpful. If you stay with us after answering questions, we have a short video at the end of a film with actual footage of that famous 1913 march on Washington, which sent more than 100 women to the hospital, as well as footage from the centennial celebration of that parade. Do we have any questions, Sudi? You need to unmute yourself. Please remember when you're asking your questions to use the chat feature and we will get to them in the order that they appear. Are there any questions? Yes, no. Hearing no questions, I will proceed to the video we have, which is uh, not too long. It's about six minutes, seven minutes, I think. Hmm. This is from the 1913 parade. On March 3rd, 1913, the day before President Woodrow Wilson's inauguration, over 5,000 women paraded down Pennsylvania Avenue toward the White House in a first of its kind demonstration for the right to vote. As thousands watched, some of the women were insulted and attacked by a mob, resulting in over 200 injuries and the call for the U.S. Army Cavalry to subdue the crowd. American History TV attended a centennial celebration of the event and interviewed participants and historians about the women's suffrage movement. The celebration was organized by Delta Sigma Theta Sorority, which was founded in January of 1913. On this day, March 3rd, 1913, they participated in a suffrage march for women to get the right to vote, even before African Americans had the right to vote. But they were visionary women who were social activists in their own day and time. As undergraduate students, they had to get a chaperone to leave campus, because if you remember 100 years ago, we didn't have freedom of movement as we have it now. Delta Sigma Theta was the only uh, African American organization that participated in the original suffrage march 100 years ago. Bishop Vashti Murphy McKenzie. I am the presiding bishop of the 10th Episcopal District of the AME Church, and that's the great state of Texas. Well, my grandmother, Vashti Charlie Murphy, of course, was one of the 22 founders of Delta Sigma Theta sorority. Uh, at Howard University, she was a student, and 
uh, she really believed in community service and that that's what our purpose is, our purpose in life. This is just an exciting day for us to be able to trace uh, the footsteps of our founders, all of our founders. But it's just a great day for our family to be able to walk the same path that our grandparents. Hmm. Mother I'm Paige Harrington, the director of the Sewell Belmont House and Museum. I'm Elspeth Kirsch. I'm the Collections and Facilities Manager at Sewell Belmont. Could you explain to viewers who don't know the history, how does what's happening here compare to what happened here 100 years ago? The most striking difference between what's happening today and what happened 100 years ago is the calmness of the parade. 100 years ago, the parade wasn't a parade so much as a riot. The police refused to protect the marchers. And so as the marchers progressed down their planned parade route, the crowds got larger and larger. They were very unruly. They'd been drinking. They started to throw th things at the women. They shouted things. They told them to go home. And a riot broke out. And not just that, streetcars continued to empty people into the already packed crowds. And so the, the crowd got larger and larger and more aggressive. And so the women couldn't go forward. The police weren't involved. In fact, the Secretary of Defense called out the Fort Myer Cavalry to push back the unruly crowd so that the women could continue their peaceful exercise of their First Amendment rights. At the end of the day, over 100 women had to go to the hospital because of their injuries. Mm -hmm. Whereas today, this is a wonderful, peaceful assembly and a celebration of how far we've come in 100 years. This was the first time a civil rights parade occurred in Washington. And what's so remarkable about this is Alice Paul was down here with the delegation of NASA, which had been pushing for women's suffrage on a state by state basis. But what you see with this parade is the movement towards a push for a federal amendment to the Constitution. And it's the start of the real suffer. It's the start of the movement that really drove us to the 19th Amendment, which gave women the right to vote. What was the status of the state-by-state -state effort at that point? At that point, 10 states had given women the right to vote, and the movement was sort of stagnating. It lost a lot of steam during the Civil War because protesting a sitting president was seen as unpatriotic, which what makes what Alice Paul did all the more inflammatory and significant, because shortly after the 1913 parade, you get into World War I, and so Alice Paul and the NWP picketed Wilson with Wilson's own words on the banners that they held in front of the White House, the first group to picket in front of the White House, which we now consider to be so common. It is. At that point, the women were actually jailed. They were jailed for obstructing traffic because they were picketing in front of the White House. They were sent to Occoquan Workhouse. They were not allowed to see their families nor communicate with their families. Several of them were kept in solitary confinement. They were beaten, they were thrown to the ground, they were given food, oatmeal with worms in it, and they were living under very deplorable, deplorable um, conditions. And public sentiment started to turn, and people started to realize that the women were fighting for something that was just and should be pushed through. And at that point, uh, President Wilson was able to be brought on board, and the 19th Aman Amendment was ultimately passed as a war measure. So they saw it as a way to unite the country, men and women, to continue fighting for democracy abroad. The what? majesty of the original parade was amazing. Inez Milholland rode on a white horse and led the marchers down Pennsylvania Avenue. There was a group of about 5,000 women that marched. And as Elspeth said, it quickly turned into a riot. And so the, the majesty of, it, of the afternoon was lost. So today we're celebrating, which is wonderful to be able to come together with so many women's organizations, including the Deltas, and become a part of this again today. Alice Paul chose the date very deliberately. It was March 3rd, 1913, the day before Woodrow Wilson took, the first, uh, took his first oath of office for his first inauguration as president. So the city was 
full of people who were here to see the president. And one of the most wonderful things in the Sewell Belmont collection is a book that has two photographs side by side. One on the left has the women marching with bedlam raining all around. And then on the right, you see the orderly military style parade that took place the next day for President Wilson's inauguration. It's incredibly striking. <laughs> If we go back to the parade on, in 1913, what was the immediate rea reaction after that, the public? The headlines for the newspapers immediately after the parade are incredible. They say things like, parade full of galaxy of suffrage beauties assaulted on street corners. I mean, the, the headlines we would consider to be just ridiculous. But the public sentiment was really part of an incredible, it underwent an incredible shift. And so before suffrage was considered this movement of old women, women who were spinsters and unattractive and unintelligent. And now with this parade, the, the newspapers saw the suffrage movement as headed by young, vibrant, intelligent, engaged educated. women, educated. Educated is really important. Mm -hmm. Educated women who wanted to take their rightful place in a democracy. If you compare the, the way the city and the police handled what happened then to now. Was, was that sort of the beginning of the change of, of how, how protests are handled? Absolutely. The, um, when Alice Paul applied for the protest permits to march in Washington, D.C., she actually couldn't get an audience with the D.C. superintendent of police until very shortly before, and he refused to turn off the streetcars. And so they continued to disgorge people into the already packed crowds. And so people just kept pushing and pushing and pushing in. Now, as a result of the terrible injuries that happened that day, the police know that they need to block off streets and stop transit and pre prevent additional people mm -hmm. from pushing against a crowd that's watching a march. We have one final question uh, from Benjamin saying, uh, I think you said Alice, Ida, Ida B. Wells was the one black woman and founder of the Chicago suffrage. Did other groups specifically exclude black women? And if so, might this have been due to how women's suffrage got sidelined in favor of black men's suffrage after the Civil War? Uh, most likely, most of the, the white suffrage groups at that time, oh, I can't see me. Uh, most of the white suffrage groups at that time were not welcoming black women, especially Southern groups like the League Women Voters in Southern states. But um, Kat's, Kat does have a pro problematic legacy, which uh, the University of Iowa has been dealing with for a number of years as far as renaming the building Cat Hall, which was named for her. Um, and that is just something that, uh, you know, you look back at the, at the people that did good things and they, does the, ju did the end justify the means or the means justify the end? And uh, that's a story for another day. <laughs> Any other questions? If not, join us again next month. We had no idea when we set these topics back in April how this one, especially on this particular day, was going to work out. And we also had no idea that barriers to voting was going to be such a, a big topic at this point in time. Um, barriers to voting is, by the way, the term that's, pre that's preferred over voter suppression Voter suppression implies that it's more negative. So that's why we're calling it barriers to voting, but we'll be certainly dealing with all of the negative things that are happening now. The good news today was that uh, the Postal Service will not be instituting all of those changes that were threatened. So uh, perhaps vote by mail will be a little bit easier. We'll see. So no other questions? We can sign off. And I will end the, we will end the meeting. Thank you for coming. Yeah, thank, thank you, you Marianne.
was great. Thank you, everybody, for spending your afternoon with us. Goodbye. Bye. Mm -hmm.